Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Concord Museum and a special program from the Massachusetts Historical Society. The awarding of the 2022 Peter J. Gomes Memorial Book Prize to Professor Robert A. Gross, James L. and Shirley A. Draper, Professor of Early American History Emeritus at the University of Connecticut for his book, The Transcendentalists and Their World. I'm Lisa Krasner, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director here at the Concord Museum, and it's a privilege for us to be the convening place for today's celebration. Professor Gross has done so much to advance Concord's history through his writing, teaching, and collaborations with the museum and other local organizations. He's left an indelible mark on our small town and elevated our history to the broadest of audiences. It is much deserved recognition to be the 2020, 2022 recipient of MHS's prestigious prize. So on behalf of all of us at the Concord Museum who are lucky to call you a colleague and friend, congratulations, Bob. For today's ceremony, Dr. Claire Nelson will present the award. Following the presentation, Professor Gross will say a few words, then be joined in conversation by Dennis, with Dennis Fiore. Please stick around following the program for a book signing and reception to toast Professor Gross. First, allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. Our award re re recipient is Robert A. Gross, the James L. and Shirley A. Draper Professor of Early American History Emeritus at the University of Connecticut. His first book, The Minutemen in the World, won the Bancroft Prize in American History. Picador Books has just released a revised and expanded edition ahead of the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, and I will be getting one of those. He is also the co-editor of An Extensive Republic, Print, Culture, and Society in the New Nation, 1790 to 1840. 40. Professor Gross is the former director of the program for the history of the book in American culture at the American Antiquarian Society. He is a trustee of the Concord Museum and a director of the Thoreau Society of America. He is also the honorary fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. 
Dennis Fiore began his professional career in government, first as a curator in a project to recreate the early 19th century fur trading fort in the Ontario wilderness. He then served as the head of visual arts and conservation for the Maine Arts and Humanities Commission before becoming the deputy director of programs at the Institute of Museum and Library Services during the Carter administration. During his career, he has served as executive director of the Concord Museum, director of the Maryland Historical Society, and president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Since retirement, he has de dedicated his efforts to preserving the heritage of Concord. He serves on the Special Commi Collections Committee at the Concord Free Public Library and on the Historic Districts Commission. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Claire Nelson, a member of the Board of Trustees at the Massachusetts Historical Society and a member of the Board of Governors at the Concord Museum as well. She will make some brief remarks and present the prize on behalf of the MHS. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society established the Peter J. Gomes Memorial Prize in honor of the late Reverend Professor Peter J. Gomes. Reverend Gomes was the plumber professor of Christian morals and Pusey minister at the Memorial Church at Harvard University. He was also an overseer, elected fellow, and board member of the Massachusetts Historical Society. A zealous preacher, orator, and lover of history, Gomes often quoted the Book of Romans and urged people to, quote, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We could not agree more that sound historical scholarship written for a broad audience helps both transform and renew one's mind. In that spirit and in the memory of Reverend Gomes who passed away in 2011, the MHS presents this award for the best nonfiction work in the history of Massachusetts published in the preceding year. This year's competition included 13 works that covered topics ranging from the Salem witch trials to mutiny on the high seas and murder in a landmark Boston hotel. The works span thousands of years of history from the age of geological formations to the 20th century. The selection committee comprised entirely of outside judges agreed to award the prize to Robert Gross for the transcendentalists in their world. Here is an excerpt from the committee statement. Gross's book builds on, upon deep research into a wide range of materials about an equally wide range of topics, offering marvelously detailed descriptions of neighborhoods, schools, churches, Masonic lodges, lyceums, and debating clubs, as well as businesses ranging from grape growing to pencil making. But The Transcendentalist is much more than a carefully observed local history rendered with compelling details. It also traces the impact of broader developments on the community as religious groups, political parties, and reform movements all attempted to shape and sway the community. And, as if this were not enough, Gross's book firmly places Emerson and Thoreau in the midst of these changes as they moved back to Concord. As Emerson developed a career as a lecturer and Thoreau spent time at Emerson's house and at Walden Pond, they began to mold new ways of thinking that drew not only from broader intellectual currents, but also the smaller world of Concord. Quote, the depth and complexity of this vision presented in elegant and exemplary prose, rich, clear, and readable, make Robert A. Gross's The Transcendentalists and Their World a worthy recipient of the 2022 Gomes Prize. Professor Gross. On behalf of Catherine Algor, President of the Massachusetts Historical Society, I present you with the 2022 Peter Gomes Memorial Book Prize. Congratulations. Wow. Well, I believe this oh. is your prize. <laughs> Well, I'm amazed at this turnout, um, but at least the rain has um, stopped for a little while, and I'm so grateful to all of you for showing up. I was asked to say a few words. Those of you who know me are skeptical, <laughs> so I wrote something out to discipline myself. Um, since this award was announced, I've heard from a number of friends who knew Peter Gomes and have told me about his tremendous impact on them as a teacher and a minister. What comes through the recollection is that he created a sense of belonging to a community or cause larger than themselves. That prompted me to take a look at his writings. And I dipped into a collection of sermons he delivered at Harvard in 1994 and 95. These proved to be a lot livelier than the sermons of Concord's Ezra Ripley and Barzillian <laughs> Fraud. One passage stands out 
as pertinent to this happy occasion. Joy is not a solitary enterprise, Gomes observed. The very notion of complete happiness, of fullness of joy, means that we are part of and belong to and are bound up with something and someone beyond ourselves and our own private satisfaction and achievements. Joy is a feeling, a consequence that cries out to be shared. So I'd like to share that joy by expressing my gratitude to the institutions and people in Concord who welcomed me to the town, took an interest in my research, hosted me in their houses, came to hear me speak, and asked, sometimes delicately, increasingly impatiently, <laughs> when or if I would ever be done. And I did credit this simply to sincere interest in my project. <laughs> I originally came to study Concord, not out of any prior attachment to the town, or nostalgia for the world of Emerson and Thoreau, but as part of an expanding wave of scholarship known as the new social history. In the early 1970s, the cutting edge of that approach was the community study, focusing on everyday life and families and farms, and reaching beyond elite white men to encompass the worlds of people up and down the social order, particularly the lives of women, of native people, and blacks. The aim of these inquiries was to delineate the typical town and the average person's experiences. And I briefly shared that purpose until I found Concord. For here was a community that took pride in its importance and its uniqueness. It couldn't be average or even above. Concord's local history was consequential for our national history and vice versa. Its actions and ideas reverberated in the wider world, even as larger forces played out in the intimate arenas of the household, the church, and the town meeting. Concord was, as this museum likes to say, the birthplace of two revolutions. The first, on April 19, 1775, igniting the fight for political independence, and the second, led by Emerson and Thoreau, in the transcendentalist quest for intellectual independence, for a democracy of mind and spirit, six decades later. How these two movements were related to one another is a question at the heart of the transcendentalists in their world. What began as a community study developed into an ever-deepening engagement with this town and civic-minded institutions and citizens. The unparalleled special collections of the Concord Free Public Library made these studies possible. And the successive curators of, of um, the special collections, uh, starting with Marsha Moss and then Leslie Wilson and now Anka Voss, they welcomed me summer after summer, sabbatical after sabbatical, to explore the vast repository they oversaw and to make my life more complicated, to which they kept adding new acquisitions. <laughs> the Concord Museum was indispensable in related ways. Conversations with David Wood over nearly four decades taught me through his observant eye to appreciate the material culture and decorative arts of Concord and New England. And thanks are due to Peggy Burke and Dennis Fiore for bringing me into the planning of a new standing exhibit why Concord, that would endure for more than two decades. And after it became outdated, I was invited by Tom Putnam to join in the brainstorming for the dazzling exhibits that have replaced it. And now a new phase of consulting um, impends as the 250th anniversary of the revolution draws near. From the very start of my academic career, these experiences with the museum emphasized the need to take history beyond the academy and into the venues where most people learn about the past once their school days are over. I also want to give, express thanks to the Massachusetts Historical Society for its contributions to my scholarship, before and after 
Dennis Fiore was at the helm. The close connection between Boston and Concord is evident in key manuscript collections I drew on for the book, collections dealing with Emerson, Kyes, and Shattuck. Mass Historical Society also provided regular forums for me to present my research, particularly in summer programs for teachers organized by Jane Gordon, with whom I've been talking about Concord um, since she was director of the Thoreau Society and education director of the Concord Museum. As this brief account suggests, it can take a community to sustain a community study. <laughs> I was incredibly fortunate in my choice, but as Thoreau once put it, perhaps in anticipation of Peter Gomes, joy is the condition of life. Hear me? Good, good. Okay. Bob, as you alluded to, we go back a long ways. <laughs> <laughs> Always pleased to have you involved in all the projects here, as I know the institution still does. Um, I'm glad for your opening remarks. You answered some of my first questions. Uh, <laughs> and set the scene. Um, but there's one that keeps cropping up, and I'd like your take on it, and you talk about it in your book, and that is there's still the question of why all this happened in this, in this place. Um, and I was reflecting back the other day, do you remember the young man in Concord who uh, started an institute to study, um, to study that? And I think he'd been watching The Shining by King, the, the movie, because he thought it, this may have been an Indian burial ground. Or, or, and he thought Egg Rock, you know, where the acid bed and the, uh, uh, and the Sudbury come together to form the Concord River. Uh, it didn't last very long, but it was a, a, a movement to find out that, that there was something special in this place beyond the practical reasons. But maybe you can tell us in a few words why Concord became so special. It was the water. <laughs> it was the water. <laughs> it was three rivers go through the town. And highways were laid out to it. You know, think about the fact that going back into the 17th century, first, the English Puritan settlers opted for a place where natives had already prepared the land in ways that would be propitious for their agriculture. You know, you had... You know, the um, planting fields for raising corn. You had the great meadows, which they could learn to harness for their cattle. Um, and you had the epidemic disease that had wiped out many of the native people. So you, we could go back and then further and, and back in time to Native American history. But if we move forward, we could say, um, okay, this was a settlement site that looked good for those English immigrants. But then in the, uh, you also have the fact that Peter Buckley, the founding minister of Concord, was really in with the elite in Boston in the general court. So Concord had always uh, sustained a close relationship to Boston. And when you look at Anne Hutchinson's trial early on, I believe Buckley was a member of the, of the mm -hmm. um, ministers who vote to expel her. So you've got a town with close connections to Boston through elite levels. You've got an economic setting that's going to be propitious. And, of course, the original land grant is huge, and it takes in much of what's now Acton, Bedford, Lincoln, 
Um, what am I leaving out? Uh, and Carlisle, yeah. 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 Right. Um, so that you got that 17th century story. And then you have, that continues. Like Peter Buckley Minister's son, Peter, a lawyer, is a major figure in the politics of late 17th century Massachusetts. You then have roads laid out that make this an important center. It's a seat of county government. You've got county courts meeting here. It's a place where um, military forces train and use as a base. And in the wars against the, the French, against native peoples, this is an important military site. So by the time you get to 1775 and the mobilization um, in preparation for potential resistance to the British regulars, you've got people used to being in Concord for one reason or another. None of that necessarily explains the intellectual and cultural history, the things in people's heads. And maybe we can let, let me stop here. We can probe that further. Great. Great, great. The, um, in reading your book, going through it, I, I was, um, could not help but look at the 1830s and 40s in Concord and compare it to what, uh, what the nation seems to be going through today. And then you sent me that opinion piece you wrote for the, I think it was the Hartford Current, uh, um, where you spoke about this and uh, about, um, about what, was, what Concord was like and how it compared to what's going on today. And I didn't know if you could sure. bring, bring up more of that. First, I do want to tell all of you that if you want to read the additional 150,000 words that I cut out of the book, <laughs> just send me a note. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to read those things. <laughs> One theme that historians always emphasize is social change. You want to go from one point to another, get reactions, and figure out what the resolution is. And one thing we also know is that historians may love social change, but their fellow citizens usually don't. You know, I thought going to town meeting in Concord that we need a new motto for this town. With the town flag, it should say, resisting change since 1775. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent a lot of my time doing that. Yes. <laughs> Just go before the zoning board and the historic <laughs> district commission, and you'll understand. So... <laughs> I think that there's two ways to answer Dennis's question. The first is something that I kind of wish I'd said clearly in the book. And that is that at the end of the Revolutionary War, Concord still has a relatively simple and inclusive social order. A social order that John Adams described once as consisting of basically four institutions. Town meeting government, and select board and local officials. One established church and the ideal one town, one church, one meeting house. Third is a militia, which required all able-bodied white men between 16 and 60 to train several times a year. And last of all, tax-supported public schools. You could add to this the tavern where people went to socialize, get the news, debate issues. And then you could add the farming world in which people exchange all the time with their neighbors, um, engaged in cooperative practices of one sort or another. And that's a pretty inclusive world. And what I show in the transcendentalists in their world is that in the wake of the revolution and increasingly from the 1820s on, people pull apart from that inclusive framework to start associations of their own. Associations that may be appealing either for common ideas and sentiments, so those who dissent from Ezra Ripley's ministry feel increasing call to worship on their own and break the ideal of one town, one church. But you've also got people who will start voluntary associations 
some, like the Agricultural Society or the Lyceum, who were basically urging people time and time again to abandon the practices of their fathers and grandfathers on the land or in the shop, to pay attention to the latest science and to put that science to work in ways to meet the market and take advantage of growing capitalism. So that might be people who join these voluntary associations, but out of their own prosperity, form enclaves of social class as well. The Minister of Concord, and I don't, didn't say this as sharply as I probably should have, Ezra Ripley, Emerson's step-grandfather, is actually the person who talks over and over and over again about the need for people to recognize their interdependence with one another. And he takes the lead in separating people off from the community. It's he who starts the social circle, the first group in Concord of elite figures to meet on their own behind closed doors without transparency for the whole community. And he then joins right up with the Freemasons, who also meet in parallel ways. So the, as, the problem is, by the 1820s and mid-1830s, people have now fractionalized, if you will, into a whole range of groups that no longer share as much with one another, not that they necessarily liked it before, but as they pull apart from one another, they're still hearing Ezra Ripley emphasize that you were born for society, that the way in which we live is to, and realize our, our lives and is in service to community. What I call in the book an ideology of interdependence. So now what do they have? They've got, they're living in ways that are at odds with the older traditions without a language to justify the new ways they're living. And only as a Ripley's bromides on, just depend on one another. Just see your duty to one another and to the community. In that context, I'm suggesting the book that Emerson articulates in his individualism, in his trust thyself, a new ethic that will justify through his invocation of the divine soul running through all of us, that will justify are putting the individual at the foundation of society before the community. But he does so in such a way as to imbue the individualism with an idealism that sees a broader service to community coming out of that. So now come back to the present. We're equally in a world of rapid change in mass communication in global economy, in, in ideas about spirituality that don't have fruition in any organized denomination. We have so many changes that have been going on that we are the, ourselves the initiators of and, and the partners in, but without a language that allows us to understand it. And it was true for the transcendentalists as I think it is today, that the changes took their shape in a rising generation of young people who didn't grow up in the old era, but haven't inherited a way to see the new one in ways that are meaningful. So they have to invent it themselves. The, uh, and speaking of Emerson, um, I, I can't think of help in thinking of the paradoxes, um, both with slavery and what you know how long it took him to uh, over time uh, um, embody, um, or I should say, uh, get involved with the abolitionist movement. And then he, as, as a man through the individualism, was talking about going out and making your way in the world and creating. Uh, uh, industry, uh, creating new ways of, of, um, of commerce, um, but at the same time railed against commerce, uh, railed against the elites, but, but joined the social circle. So um, can you tell us a little more about that? I'll tell you one even more pointed. On the eve of his divinity school address at Harvard, 
in which he basically s says um, to the assembled graduates and their parents and the faculty that you've been training for the ministry here at Harvard Divinity School. You're farther away from doing anything meaningful than you were the day you enrolled. <laughs> Which is another version of what he said in the American Scholar Address to a larger group of graduates. He's like your anti-commencement speaker. <laughs> and so, um, essentially, Emerson's message is at one and the same time looking backwards and trying to free people from the constraints and blind traditions of the past, and looking forward at the new ways of living under capitalism and populist democracy that he equally fears. As Emerson was a dialectical thinker who could, at one and the same time, aim to free people from the ancient and time-worn and now outworn traditions, and help them save themselves from the constraints that were coming in. In that setting, he also I, he writes in his journal on the eve of his Divinity School address, thinking about his own step-grandfather, Ezra Ripley, and Barzoli Frost, the assistant minister, he, he says, let the grandfathers die. That's in his journal a few years before Ezra Ripley finally says goodbye to the first parish. So Emerson, you know, here is not so much contradictory as in one or another expression, um, looking backward or forward. And in that sense, he also tries to, as I suggested before, break through to a vision of people using the new freedoms they have, but never, but in his ladder of the uses of nature, go beyond and above and transcend mere economic uses and move to um, aesthetic and spiritual ends. Essentially, what Emerson wants to do is embrace the new freedom of the individual, but put it to higher uses than making money and getting and spending. And by doing so, promising them that they'll realize a higher purpose. The problem is, of course, that you can't count on people to the higher uses. <laughs> the uh, staying on this on this theme with Emerson, um, I was taken uh, uh, taken by the statement uh, when he was talking about the social library, which is the first lending library in Concord, and how he t uh, how he sort of railed against the new novels that were uh, that were that were filling this institution that was supposed to be a a, a place where you where you went to learn about things. But he also made a statement that uh, those that, that go there were getting knowledge, but they weren't getting wisdom. And I, I really loved that statement. D define wisdom as a transcendentalist saw it. And Thoreau, of course, saw it through nature, uh, gaining wisdom. <laughs> well, wisdom, I'm thinking for Thoreau in particular, consists in simplicity, not complexity. You know, getting to the marrow of the bone, seeing things in their essentials, which I think he would mean, and Emerson would mean, that you're overcoming the gap between self and the world outside you, that by connecting to a larger spirit, to a Godhead, to a deep truth, you're joined together. I mean, that was Emerson's goal as a lecturer that he could articulate sentiments that everybody shared. And in so doing, you would both enable them to feel renewed and go out from the lecture with the courage to take hold of their lives, 
and simultaneously be all joined together in spirit as a community. That is to say, the Lyceum was for him, as he said, a secular pulpit. And in one way or another, it's also a legacy to many a college professor at small colleges in Western Massachusetts, seen him by. <laughs> um, the uh, moving over to the whole question of slavery and conquer, which I know a lot has been done on. I'm, I'm still taken by the fact that Ezra Ripley had a slave, which is quite amazing. But um, I was uh, interested in all the way, and those of us who have heard about the 1619 project and various other attempts to look at. Sounds like it went off. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the, the attempts to, to look at what slavery has wrought through the whole of the, uh, the American experience. I was simply taken aback by all the ways that conquered commerce uh, w made their money on the back of slavery. Uh, everything from the cotton that was here for the mills that was picked by the slaves uh, to the sending, the exporting of beef and pork uh, to the uh, Caribbean plantations. Um, and there are many more examples, but can you talk about that? Well, Massachusetts and New England more broadly were the lifeline for the 17th century Caribbean colonies. And a lot of the great fortunes in, in Boston and, and the countryside were built up on the profits of that trade. You know, where's your country house? Where's your son? Your, you know, it could be in Jamaica or Barbados, wherever. Um, and then there was Concord. Um, you can think about the fact that um, You've got big landowners in Lincoln and, and Belmont and Waltham who are loyalists who take off for their places in the West Indies. So you've, you've got that going on. At the same time, the people in Massachusetts can distance themselves from the source of their wealth because it's not around them except in the form of household slavery. This is different, of course, for the Narragansett plantations in Rhode Island. But in Concord, there were only at any time about two dozen or so enslaved people. And that number was not growing on the eve of the revolution. It's also true for Boston that the numbers were actually falling. So you could say that slavery was not a growth enterprise in this part of New England in the quarter century before the revolution. But at the same time, and, and, and anti-slavery sentiment was also rising um, in relation to um, the growing cries for liberty um, and some cries for equality on the 1775-76. I mean, I think it does matter that Massachusetts turned down a proposed constitution in 1778 that drew a racial line and adopted a constitution 1780 that has no racial restriction. All that's true, but the key issue here, I think, is that many, many people in New England were opposed to slavery, but the end of slavery did not mean an embrace of racial equality. And that's, I think, the crucial issue. That until you have a movement that's actually pressing for racial equality and equal citizenship, you don't have anything but a disappointing end to slavery. And I was, you know, again, amazed at, at how many people made their living um, through serving the slave industry. For instance, Elijah Wood and his production of shoes that were sent to southern slaves, and, and uh, uh, Dan, um, uh, Shattuck, who made straw hats uh, that covered the heads of those picking cotton in the, in the fields. Um, it, was, it was quite amazing. It was quite an eye-opener. Um, moving on to the Masonic movement. Uh, which I don't claim to ever understand. And can you tell well, you us? Well, haven't been admitted to the mysteries. You're not supposed to, right? But can you explain to it why, why it became so popular in Concord in the 1830s? Well, yeah, actually, so it was started in 1798, and Ezra Ripley, who never saw a voluntary organization in Concord that he didn't want to be the head of. <laughs> <laughs> He's a founding member of the Masonic Lodge. Four years after 
he got the social circle started. One of the things that, okay, we can first, the argument he would have made for Freemasonry is um, it's a handmaiden to Christianity. The lessons preached by the Masons, which are learned in rituals behind closed doors by the brothers who enlist, those lessons only teach the virtues that Christianity also fosters. Now, you might say, so why do I need the Masons? I'll just go to church. What's the deal here? They never really had a good answer for that, but they'd say, we combine the promotion of virtue and character with the knowledge of science that goes back to King Solomon's temple and the architects. So at, at the level of Masonic activity, there's something really quite striking. Knowledge is gained from old books. It's passed on through traditions and rituals that are the same from generation to generation over time, memorial. In addition, Masonic organizations are chartered from the top down and not run from the bottom up. They follow procedures and rules and regulations that are uniform across in local chapters. And when the Masons meet, it's typically in a village center above a store building. What could be more opposite transcendentalism? Mm -hmm. Which believes we get our truth from nature, that knowledge is always being, you know, if you will, learned at the moment, not handed down in old books, is works from the bottom up of the individual soul and of, of, of group, not being imposed from above. So what struck me is Ezra Ripley, Ralph Waldo Emerson's step-grandfather, is the leading Mason in town, along with the politician John Kyes. At the, now, the secret of meetings of the Masons get a lot of people worried. Wives and mothers wondering what this all-male fraternity does behind closed doors? Mm. What kind of back and nail you're taking place? <laughs> what fraternity should be banned on campus? You know, um, what kind of activity is going on here? So there's a morals fear. Masonry is bad for your morals, not an incubator of virtue. In addition, the real appeal to of Freemasonry is that there are lodges all over the country. By 1825, you've got you know anti you've got masonry at a peak throughout the United States. Governors, senators, much of Andrew Jackson's cabinet when he gets like are all members of Freemason. And people begin to suspect that Freemasons are being behind closed doors to rig the political system. And they get support for our guys. I mean, you might be a young man in your mid-20s, moving from town to town. You're involved in trade. You want to work in a store. Or maybe you're an aspiring lawyer. If you join the Masons, you get people who are already your friends who are going to help you out. So what's with this rig system? Anti-Masonry grows in opposition to the rig system. And Concord is a real latecomer to this. It's even slower to embrace anti-Masonry than it was resistance to Britain. But when they do, within about two years, everything explodes here. And what I'm suggesting in the book is not that anti-Masonry gives way to transcendentalism, but rather the collapse of Freemasonry for a decade or so shows the inability of this world, which, after all, George Washington and Ben Franklin were part of, its, its increasing irrelevance 
to the new world emerging, to which transcendentalism will speak. The, uh, I have, can I just say, researching all this, I spent too much time wondering what on earth was I going to do with the Mason. <laughs> <laughs> the um, sort of a word you see quite a bit these days is illiberal. And um, I was interested to see, uh, to ask you what Thoreau meant when he said uh, churchers were making people illiberal. That Thoreau said that, uh, uh, that the churches were making people illiberal. Ah. Well, these days, people in Texas would be surprised to find that Conquer was ever accused of being illiberal. <laughs> <laughs> but he would have meant, and says in Walden, that there are many Bibles, not just the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible. There are many Vedas and Hindu scriptures and Muslim scriptures that we could pile up till they reach the heavens. That Christianity, through its denominational splits and conflicts, closed people into sectarian identities. And that in so doing, People couldn't see beyond them to feel connections to the divine spirit running through everything and that could connect them to their neighbors and to God. And that was really a crucial thing because um, transcendentalism in important ways comes in in the early to mid-1830s as a reform-minded Unitarian, radical Unitarian, address to the impending crisis brought by the disestablishment of religion in Massachusetts. In 1834, that takes place, and suddenly you've got a problem. Ezra Ripley and Unitarian-leaning ministers all over eastern Massachusetts have to compete for followers and worshipers and people who pay the bills. How are you going to do that? Well, you could sell your brand, but the transcendentalists and the, and the Unitarian reformers say something like this. What is religion? Well, it's not a building. You could worship God on a hillside or in a cathedral. It's not a dogma. Look at how many dogmas there are among the Christian churches. It can't be a ritual or a form of worship, from the silent Quakers to the highly ritual Catholics, once again. So what is religion? The answer they give is this divine spirit running through everything. That's in you, because you are already made to feel religious sentiments that are inborn. It's pretty circular reasoning. As if you think there's, there's an inborn divinity, because you feel it, then it must be in the wider world and how you're made, but that view of religion as essentially divine spirit that can take many forms, no one of which is superior to the other, is the beginning of what we might say the comparative study of religion. In a sense, all religion departments at colleges and universities have their foundation in that insight. The, um Concord is a hotbed of scientific farming. And I think of uh, uh, Simon Brown, and uh, is it American gardener, American farmer, or New England farmer? New England, New England farmer, um, which was very influential. Um, and um, the, it had a great effect on, quote, social norms and cooperative customs. And you already touched on, on some of this. Uh, but was Concord unusual that way in scientific farming? Uh, and maybe you can talk a little more about how it, how it changed the culture. Well, I don't think Concord was unusual in the readiness of people to take up progressive farming. I think this would have been true. It's a broad movement. But it's also the case that the pressures that farmers felt 
owing to the opening of the Erie Canal, the flood of cheap Western grains into this region. Um, the pressures they felt were driving some people out. The land in Concord was not productive enough to sustain more than probably one son or at most two on the farm. So by the 1820s and 1830s, most young men and young women are going to have to move away. But it wasn't just pressures that are pushing people out. There was a lot of incentives. Remember, the Waltham Mills get started here in the teens of the 1800s, and then the Lowell Mills are started. The Middlesex County is the Silicon Valley of the 19th century. And that means that there's a lot of prosperity that's spreading from that economic activity. So there are a lot of incentives to want to take up new farming practices that are going to allow people to take advantage of growing town and urban markets. And so you have the combination of farmers who can't adapt, who are trying to continue in the old ways, and farmers who are progressive. If you go up uh, Monument Street to, to um, Hutchins Farm, that's where Nathan Barrett had his farm and Daniel Hunt on the other side of the road. And if you follow in the book, you can see that the Hunt family was struggling to sustain the old corn and pumpkin farming, whereas the Barretts with Nathan were experimenting with fine apples for the eating on the table and other fruit trees and the like to send into Boston. Um, so you've got both of those things going on at a time. Emerson went with, on a walk with Hawthorne in the mid-1840s out into the countryside. And he writes in his journal a description of what he sees as one of the old decrepit pig farms. And he reflects on the fact that all the bright young sons and daughters are leaving the farm for the opportunities in the city and the West. And only the unambitious and lazy and unintelligent sons and daughters are staying on the homestead. And he begins to realize that all this migration may serve to make Concord poor and declining. And so I discuss this in the book. He gives a lecture to the young American that at first can sound like just manifest destiny. But in fact, it's a lecture in which he says, we could reform and make a model town here in which you didn't have to move. Or if you're a merchant, if you're successful, you need a country place. And you could put your intelligence and progressive knowledge to work on farming here. So Emerson had in mind, picking up on the larger question of farming, a way to manage the land that could sustain lots of small towns and prosperity. What Emerson didn't do, but what Thoreau did, is realize that the vast westward movement would have huge and terrible consequences for native peoples and would have vast environmental consequences that we're still feeling. Bringing things around full circle, um, I was taken by an Emerson quote uh, that is very much as of today. Politicians treated power as a prize instead of a trust. Uh, and you describe this as a selfishness run rampant. Tell us more. What does that say at all? <laughs> I was going to say true by definition. <laughs> well, Emerson had absorbed what we might see as the republicanism of John Adams and John Quincy Adams and most of the founding generation that they believed in government by consent but believe the people should consent to their betters to rule them. That governance required knowledge. And we might actually not want to agree. <laughs> but a knowledge that only those with the means would have the opportunity to acquire. 
And they also absorb, Emerson and his generation at Harvard, absorbed the notion that demagogues were always there seeking to stir up suspicion among common folk against their well-minded and well-educated rulers so that the demagogues could take power themselves. And why did they want to do that? Selfishness. They wanted power. They wanted money. So when Emerson looks at the Andrew Jackson and his party, he sees a replay of the 1790s in America and of the corrupt figures who were ministers to the king who helped provoke the revolution. In that sense, Emerson is an old-fashioned uh, classical Republican who might have deserved to be overthrown with his ilk in the rise of popular democracy. But he also saw that popular democracy was bringing in all kinds of party organizers, political machine operators of the spoil system. And that popular government would no more empower the individual because of its reliance upon mass political parties and masses and parades and, and rallies and the like um, than did whatever existed before. That is, you might, once again, Emerson's dialectical. So what you might really see here is, you look back to the 18th century and you see elites claiming to act in the interest of everybody, but sometimes in their interest of themselves. And then you get them overthrown for mass political parties run by party elites who are acting to assemble numbers and votes and make money. And do any of those actually empower the individual? Can't democracy be a means of public education, of citizenship for purposes that Peter Gomes would have admired for something larger than ourselves? Dennis, we only have a couple more minutes. So. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> What's my last question? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I guess I do have a last question. We talked about this earlier. So when you start the, on the next book and the rest of Concrete <laughs> History? Well, we get those pages off the cutting room floor. <laughs> I, I will say this, that So there have been some reviewers who have said, it takes a long time to get to the transcendentalist. <laughs> but I had to tell the story from the 1790s to the 1840s that nobody told before. Now having told it, if I were to do a proposal for the same book, I would start when Emerson moved to Concord in 1834. And I would take it to the, through the Civil War. That's because I'm interested in Concord. The challenge is, what new would we learn about American history by telling the later story? I'm not so sure. Because what the transcendentalist in the world does, what the Miniman does, is it captures the town at a moment when a small town could still act independently and think it was riding the ways of change. By the 1850s, whether you're looking at anti-slavery or other, or the Know Nothing Party, Lincoln's Republican Party, Concord is more acting in tune with what's happening elsewhere than itself being an initiator. Think, for example, the fact that much of the action in the abolitionist movement in the 1850s is helping um, and trying to frustrate the fugitive slave law. But most of the actions are in Boston. And Concord, like other towns, activists are responding in, in turn. So that's one thing. But the second is that transcendentalism develops in the mid 1830s to the late 1840s. It's not entirely clear to me that as Emerson becomes national, that he's actually preaching transcendentalism so much as offering an idealistic critique of the nation 
that can merge with a good many others, for example, Henry Ward Beecher, who would never have claimed to be a transcendentalist until the money was there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that I actually am the transcendentalist in the world at just the right moment. Uh, Emerson's on the verge of a national career, which will be less beholden to transcendentalism. And Conquer's on the verge to losing a certain amount of uniqueness, as it does what lots of other places do. So the book, and maybe I should have said that more explicitly in the preface, but one thing about talking about a book that you've written is that you get to understand what you've written by going on the hustings. <laughs> Well, now we'll open it up to all the questions I didn't ask. Anybody have a question? Brian? Uh, Bob, thank you for your instinct to enlighten. And uh, I'd like to compliment you on your necktie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question um, relates to the role of taverns in the period between 1740 and 1840. Uh, we were largely an oral culture uh, before broadsheets and print came in. And so the tavern uh, was a place to formulate our notions about community and society. Uh, what credit would you give to the right tavern, to the formulations of what we now call democracy? Ah. Those of you who, those of you who don't Right tavern is, as we speak, undergoing uh, long consideration as a public museum, uh, and I'm, I'm committing that's trying to interpret it. Can you guys? Yeah, why don't you hold this? Okay, I could maybe stand up and be like old Phil Donahue. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, um, I think that the taverns were really important meeting places, and in the, over the course of the 18th century, became increasingly popular. Concord had, I think, eight or nine neighborhood taverns, including the village taverns, by the eve of 1775. Um, it became, to license people to have taverns, became a great way of giving out political patronage. So you have little grog shops and the like. It's not the case that they were just for an oral culture. Taverns were a key place to read the newspapers. And so you could go there and follow the news, read the political pamphlets, and argue about um, the British policies and the like. After the revolution, taverns become concentrated into um, the village in Concord. So there, by the 1830s, there may be three or four. Three are in the center of town. And the temperance movement then starts to crusade against haunting ale houses. And when the temperance movement does that, it says, why do you have to sit in the tavern? Go home and read the newspaper with your family. Read a book. So the growth of the Lyceum, the library, um, are key to the temperance movement. And You have spent much of your career uh, tracking and recording the dissolution of mutualism as an ideology, uh, well, or at least the conflict over that. And can, can you ever imagine a time when uh, an idea of mutualism and mutual obligation is ascendant again in the United States? Or, or, or are we done with that? <laughs> and uh, institutionalism in general. Well, if you'd send me that as an email or a ta uh, and social media, then we could have an impersonal community face to face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that every major innovation in communications unsettles people until they get used to it. In important ways, the mutualism that I see as a cutting edge against the old community became the foundation, as Tocqueville saw it, of the voluntary association and democracy in America. And we can jump ahead another century and a half, and we have Robert Putnam worrying that we're bowling alone. Mm. 
So one generation's innovation becomes then another generation's object of nostalgia as the new generation tries to figure out other modes of acting. So I would say that um, also our partisanship has, over the last quarter century, provoked strong nostalgia for civic culture. But not just nostalgia, attempts to rebuild it. So I would say that on the whole I'm optimistic. You've all come out. Presumably. <laughs> Not just because you want to buy books, that's the lower use of this afternoon, but out of your own attachment to Concord or to New England or to transcendentalism. Higher purposes indeed. Or to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll share the joy. <laughs> we have time for one more question? No? No. Really out of time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. But please stick around for the reception and book signing, and Bob can, I'm sure, answer more questions and talk more. But please enjoy. We have fun, wine Bob. and cheese and books, the lower form of the afternoon. <laughs>